In a city of uninteresting boxy towers, one building defies convention. A residential tower whose exoskeleton looks like a giant scorpion? More like a giant lobster. At Miami's Biscayne Boulevard, this $450 million tower conceived in the mind of one of the world's most pioneering architects, Dame Zaha Hadid. This will be one of her most ambitious projects. On the 31st of March, 2016, the team received the devastating news. We're actually, you know, creating a legacy building for the architect herself. But the problems had only just begun. On September 10th, 2017, Hurricane Irma tears through Miami with winds exceeding 100 miles per hour. The developers were hit with an $82 million lawsuit that threatened to collapse the entire project. How did the developers keep Zaha's final vision alive? This is the story of Miami's 1000 Museum, Zaha Hadid's final masterpiece. This video is brought to you by Hoseo, America's most advanced home buying and selling platform. On Hoseo, you'll find one of the largest collection of homes for sale in America. Home sellers can sell fast and save thousands in commissions, all online. Check out Hoseo.com on the web or the Hoseo mobile app. Miami, a city celebrated for its art, its rhythm, and its sun. From vibrant nightlife, tropical beaches, to year-round warmth, Miami is a place where culture and energy never stop evolving. And along Miami's Biscayne Boulevard, right across from Museum Park, rises one of the city's most eye-catching towers. 1000 Museum is a dramatic and unmistakable addition to Miami's skyline. In the skyline with uninteresting boxy towers, 1000 Museum defies convention. The tower's defining feature is its white, curving exoskeleton, a web-like lattice of structural ribs that rises from a sculpted podium and runs up the entire facade. The exoskeleton partially conceals the building's terraces and balconies. The result? Distinctive rounded openings and sculptural voids at the podium level. This exoskeleton it's almost like the outside of a scorpion, or it has its hard shell. At street level, the exoskeleton blossoms into a flared, organic base. It frames the main porte cochere. You feel like you're entering a private museum or gallery instead of a conventional condo lobby. Inside, the first thing you notice is the space. Then you notice that there are no harsh corners, just smooth lines that continue from outside. The curved lines make you feel like you're living inside a piece of art. Beneath the curves, six levels of parking hide 357 spots reserved exclusively for residents. That's right, this is a residential tower. The walls and ceilings inside imitate the outside, turning everyday rooms into sculptural spaces. And here's something wild. The layout of the 84 units, they are all unique. Because of the way the columns move through the building, virtually every unit has slightly different structural elements. In a normal high-rise, you build one floor and stamp it out 20 times. Not here. Each floor twists and shifts with the outer frame, which means every wall, doorway, and fixture had to be drawn from scratch. And of course, since this is Miami, luxury is baked into every inch. You'll never see these door handles anywhere else. So little things like this, the attention to detail for everything is very well thought out here. Every residence has private elevator access that opens directly into the unit. No shared hallways, no interruptions. The residences, we're talking sleek finishes, designer kitchens, spa-like bathrooms, and floor-to-ceiling glass. All that pulls Biscayne Bay right into your living room. Each residence feels less like a condo and more like a mansion in the clouds. Wraparound balconies let you lounge, dine, or just watch the sunset over the water. Being in a project of Zaha Hadid and her last project, this is like owning a piece of art and living in a piece of art, right? More than stunning homes, residents gain access to world-class amenities. 
an entire floor is dedicated to wellness and relaxation. Here, residents can unwind in spas, saunas, steam rooms, and rain showers. The tower also includes a state-of-the-art fitness center. At the very top, a double-height aquatic center features an infinity-edge pool. For entertainment and events, residents have access to a soaring sky lounge, a triple height space overlooking Biscayne Bay, and just when you think it can't get more extravagant, a helipad crowns the tower, offering residents the rare privilege to bypass Miami's traffic and touch down in style. Behind this bold experience in luxury and engineering were two developers who dared to take the risk. Greg Coven and Louis Bertman. Coven developed 10 Museum Park, the Montclair, and Angler's Hotel. I've been a developer in South Florida 25 years. Mostly I do uh, hotel, condominium, uh, mixed use, commercial as accessory. Uh, I've been doing it myself for 20, 25 years. Birdman, on the other hand, brought years of experience in real estate investment. So you are an architect, and then you had this passion for the real estate. So yeah, I moved away from architecture in, in the late 90s and started getting involved in real estate development um, throughout the state of Florida and elsewhere in the United States. Together, they weren't just looking to build just another luxury tower. Colvin and Birdman wanted a landmark, something that would redefine Miami's skyline. That's when they turned to Zaha Hadid the one architect who never settled for ordinary. Zaha Hadid was a rule breaker, a record setter, and a visionary who changed skylines across the world. Zaha was born in Baghdad in 1950 into a progressive intellectual family. She went on to study mathematics at the American University of Beirut around 1968 and 1969. By 1972, she was in London studying at the Architectural Association School of Architecture. It was a seamless intersection between two passions for her. Math gave her the language of patterns and curves, and she turned that into architecture like nobody else. We, we focus a lot of time on how we look at the idea of like a, a, an imaginary world. In this case, was like, as I say, the ground. In 1980, she launched her own firm, Zaha Hadid Architects. We signed off as Zaha Hadid Architects 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, and it was built from, from that point. We started off with five people. We were at maybe went up to 25 till more recently, we have 400 people. Three years later, in 1983, Zaha won the Hong Kong Peak Club competition, an international architectural design competition held in 1982 and 1983. It was to build a private leisure club on Victoria Peak in Hong Kong, commonly called the Peak Leisure Club. Zaha Hadid's radical, deconstructivist proposal won the competition, and that became a milestone project that helped launch Zaha's international career. The building was never built, but that was the moment people went, okay, she's different. Zaha Hadid's first project, the Vitra Fire Station in 1993, looked less like a firehouse and more like something from Blade Runner. And the awards, they poured in. In 2004, Zaha Hadid became the first woman to win the Pritzker Prize. The Pritzker Prize is widely regarded as the most prestigious award in architecture, often called the Nobel Prize of Architecture. It's wow. It's a wow factor and it's a fantastic day for me and it's a great deal for me. I'm not going to be blasé about this, it's really a great honor. And to be honest, it's a delicious pleasure to receive this very special award. In 2012, Queen Elizabeth II honored Zaha Hadid with the title of Dame, one of Britain's highest distinctions. Zaha brought her obsession with fluidity to her newest residential tower. With 1000 Museum, Hadid wasn't interested in cramming people into cookie-cutter apartments. Zaha saw her architecture as dynamic sculpture, each curve a deliberate gesture that shaped how people experience space. She wanted flow and freedom. But before the curves and glass took shape, engineers had to tackle Miami's most unforgiving element, its unstable ground. Miami is basically sitting on a sponge, porous limestone with seawater lurking underneath. It's perfect for the beaches, but terrible for skyscrapers. 
The project was led by De Simone, consulting engineers, and O'Donnell Danwolf, partners architects, each pushing the boundaries of what was possible. Nearly 400 engineers and workers were behind the tower. And what did these engineers do? They used advanced engineering to make Zaha Hadid's design possible. 1000 Museum's foundation work began in December 2014. The engineers drilled 227 piles about 177 feet deep into the earth, the deepest foundation shafts in Miami history. Without the piles, the tower would have sunk. And trust me, you don't want your luxury condo sinking like the Millennium Tower of San Francisco. The Millennium Tower is now tilting more than 29 inches at the northwest corner. Then came the mat pour, a 12 feet thick concrete base for the building. Nearly 10,000 cubic yards of concrete had to be delivered by 1,000 trucks in one continuous 24-hour marathon. The logistics alone were mind-boggling. We're making sure that the trucks don't stop at any point. They come to the concrete pumps, they deliver the concrete and they get out and we make sure that they get back out on I-95 so that they can return to their plant. They had to control the temperature of the concrete, the timing and the flow, or it would crack like a bad souffle. The construction of 1000 Museum began in April 2015. Zaha Hadid's designs showed a fluidic exoskeleton, which wasn't just decoration, it was structurally important. The tower wasn't only designed to look bold, it had to survive Miami. The exoskeleton acted as a giant hurricane brace. Its sweeping curves created diagonal support strong enough to handle winds of up to 180 miles per hour. At the base, the columns fanned outward, then rose as a rigid continuous tube. That shape helps distribute hurricane loads evenly across the frame, keeping sway to a minimum, but engineers couldn't just pour regular concrete into curvy molds and call it a day. Zaha Hadid's solution was to use glass fiber reinforced concrete panels, or GFRC. Lighter, flexible, smooth. It was also the first time GFRC was used as permanent formwork on a high-rise, an innovation that shaved months off construction timeline. The GFRC shell added another layer of defense. We explored everything from poured concrete to, to faux to steel and seeing if we could achieve the finish. This really was the only way to achieve Zaha's design. The panels served as permanent formwork. They created a dense, impact-resistant skin, capable of withstanding both lateral and gravitational loads. The perimeter frame didn't just fight storms, it freed the interiors. As the exoskeleton carried the load, it aided in Zaha Hadid's iconic idea of column-free floor plates. But ambitious designs come with their own challenges. The GFRC panels were not made in Florida, not even in the US. The 4,800 unique panels were made in Dubai. These panels were then shipped across the ocean in custom-made cradles. On site, the GFRC panels had to line up perfectly, but instead, the steel pins didn't sit where they were supposed to. Some of the bolts were bent. The inserts didn't match either. There were tiny misalignments at the bottom too. By the time they reached higher levels in construction, those little misalignments had snowballed into nearly an inch gap. You've got a hole here and, and you're, you're here. Yeah, it's made to go together like Legos, but uh, you gotta make sure all your Lego pieces fit first. At one point, the crew tried to muscle a stubborn panel into place. It is a, a real problem. Engineers had no choice but to improvise. So they tightened one joint, shimmed another, and adjusted whatever they could. Engineers on site were on call with engineers in Dubai every day, double checking every move until they got it right. Eventually, they succeeded. But as this bold tower was taking shape, tragedy struck in March 2016. Zaha Hadid visited a hospital in Miami for bronchitis, but suffered a sudden heart attack during the treatment. Zaha Hadid's untimely death was a devastating loss for everyone in Zaha Hadid Architects. 
I'm James Vallis. Saha Hadid, the world-renowned architect whose designs include the London Olympic Aquatic Center, as well as other works across the globe, has died at a hospital in Miami. She was 65 years old. To honor her legacy, the developers made a decision. The tower had to be finished exactly as she envisioned it. They kept her name on every blueprint, permit, and press release. The project would be remembered as Zaha Hadid's final masterpiece, her first residential tower in the Western Hemisphere, and one of the last she ever completed. But nature wasn't done testing this tower. After battering its way through the Caribbean, Hurricane Irma, currently a Category 4 storm, has slammed into the lower Florida Keys, lashing the island chain with winds of up to 130 miles per hour. In 2017, as construction was underway, Hurricane Irma barreled toward Miami with winds strong enough to tear cranes from rooftops and shatter glass across downtown. Crews rushed to secure thousands of fragile exoskeleton panels, each one custom cast and nearly impossible to replace. Irma forced work to halt, flooded parts of the site, and turned the project into a race against time. One mistake one loose panel and months of progress would have been wiped out. But the tower's design proved its worth. The exoskeleton, engineered to fight against extreme wind forces, held firm. And when the storm passed, workers returned to a structure still standing strong, a project still alive. See this strapping? In the event the wind comes through here, and it is a Cat 5, it'll keep these windows from flipping up and smashing through there and potentially flying out in the air. 1000 Museum was finally completed in 2022. Even with delays, the design maintained an untouchable presence. Everything about this tower screamed success, except the balance sheets. The total project cost around $450 million. And in 2021, Coleman and Birdman hit a financial wall. Mott Cohn Estates, tied to the Rubin Brothers in London, sued Coven and Birdman for $82.7 million. The issue? 15 unsold condos tied to a loan dating back to 2016. The developers fired back, stating COVID travel bans stopped lenders from even inspecting the building. Fair excuse, but still, millions were on the line. Coven and Birdman secured a brand new $90 million loan, and boom, the old debt was cleared. The lawsuit was gone, and the crisis averted. By late 2021, about 90% of units were sold. David and Victoria Beckham bought a full floor penthouse in 2020 to stay close to their Inter Miami football club. 1000 Museum, or the Scorpion Tower as some call it, wasn't just another condo, it became a status symbol. So where are we now? The lawsuits are resolved and the finances stabilized. The tower stands 700 feet tall, gleaming on the Miami skyline. It's hurricane resistant and engineered to withstand Miami's brutal winds and storms, a skyscraper that turned engineering into performance art. 1000 Museum is less like a building and more like a monument, a tribute to the woman who dreamed it into existence. So here's my question for you. Would you want to live in this tower? Check out Howzio Buildings on Howzio.com. You can explore the amenities, look at available units, schedule a showing, and even send an offer all online. Drop your thoughts below. I spend hours researching and writing these short documentaries and a lot more to bring them to life in the videos for you. Please consider subscribing to Howzio. It's free, you know? If you enjoyed this video, hit that like button and ring the notification bell so you never miss an episode from Howzio.